afternoon, everyone, once again. I welcome you all and thank you for joining us in the Founder Series. Um, this is, my name is Frances, and I am an executive assistant that helped to drive some of the initiatives of the Tony Hassan Eye Foundation Academy. This is the 16th lecture of the series. The series started last that highlighted um, building a sustainable eye care system in South Saharan Africa. In 2022, the team is on leadership and influence for 2022. Just a brief introduction on some of our house rules. Um, we kindly ask that and have your microphones turned off. Um, only the speaker would have their camera on. Um, also, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask during this session, you can either raise your hand or you can post your questions in the chat box during the session. I'll do a quick summary of um, the Eye Foundation Eye Care System, of which um, the Koli Hassan Eye Foundation Academy is a part of. Eye Foundation Hospital was established in 1993 and is one of the first private indigenous training institutes in Nigeria. Um, the Desert Community Vision Institute is a part of a key component of Eye Foundation Hospital, which offers the training, all ophthalmology training. But now they could now known as the Kule Hassan Eye Foundation Academy, which offers training in the areas of ophthalmology subspecialties, optometry, ophthalmic nursing, and ophthalmic um, assistance. One of the key functions of the Kole Hassan Eye Foundation Academy is trying to bridge the gap in the depth of human resources in the area of eye care. We have, um, I have the program of, of the schedule of events, so I'm on the welcome address. Then I'll do a brief introduction of the speaker. And today's topic will be, will be discussed by one of the executive directors of the Kole Hassan Eye Foundation Academy. Afterwards, we have the interactive session and then the closing remarks. For those who are joining us for the first time, I say a special welcome to you. This is a series that takes place the first Saturday of every month, and we are happy to um, to the previous sessions that we had. Um, they can be seen on our YouTube page. So we, these are some of the lectures we've had during the period, not to waste so much of your time. Um, I would like to do a quick introduction of the speaker for today, Dr. Ayode, director of St. Edmund's Eye Hospital. It's the second generation, and it's the second generation of ophthalmologists of, with experience of almost four decades in ophthalmology practice. She is an executive director of the Kuli Hazan Eye Foundation Academy and a board member of the Anglo Nigerian Welfare Association for the Blind. She obtained a medical degree from the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Following which, she proceeded to undertake her postgraduate in ophthalmology at the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital in Dublin, Ireland. After obtaining an ophthalmology degree in Ireland in 1989, she had a member. She became a member of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in the United Kingdom in 1990. She has attended several postgraduate ophthalmology courses, which includes the Stanford University. Palo Alto, California, USA. The Morphe Eye Hospital in London. She, she's done other further courses in her field of specialization in Turin, Italy, Leuven, Belgium, Bonny, Germany, and other organized in main USA by the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, Boston. She has been a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology since 1999 and commenced her sub specialization in glaucoma in the same year. She is a fellow of the James Sandaka Glaucoma Institute Eye Foundation Hospital, Lagos, Nigeria, where she consulted as a glaucoma specialist for 15 years. She is a member of the International Glaucoma Association, the Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria, Glaucoma Society of Nigeria, and American Association for Physician Leadership. And she organizes monthly outreach community programs. She holds a master's in business administration from the University of Wolverhampton, United Kingdom, and her dissertation was on succession planning. Management from the Lagos Business School and University of Washington, USC. She's an avid swimmer and enjoys reading and plays guitar. 
to be speaking on the topic today on passing the battle. So Dr. Harriman, we welcome you and we thank you for being able to teach this lecture with us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Francis, and thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the chairman of the Kunle Hazan I Foundation Academy, uh, Dr. Kunle Hazan, for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to thank God for also making this day possible. Um, when Dr. Hazan, well, well, when I asked him who's going to give the next lecture, and he said, oh, he hadn't thought about it, and then he said, oh, you haven't given any lecture, give, and I said, ha, and he said, you like challenges, and well, I took up the challenge. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. So I do not take it lightly, I'm honored. And I pray that even this day, I will kindle a fire in the heart of many business owners, clinicians in particular, about the need for succession planning. As we go along, sorry, I'm going to share my slide now. Um, Francis, yeah, okay. I think we had practiced that, that's it. I want to believe you can see my slide now. So I chose this topic because I felt the need to stay up, as I said, and kindle a fire in the hearts of business owners, clinicians, about the need for succession planning. Now, I'd like us all to think that who is going to run our businesses after us? Who is going to take charge? Even in succession planning, there are families, there are um, 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 somebody takes becomes the head of a family so there's succession from one generation to another so i'm going to talk about my experience in this race using my journey in saint edmunds as a case study and this is my outline so i'll first of all start by saying that we're all in a racetrack life is a racetrack our business is a racetrack it's like a racetrack our family setup is like a racetrack and in every family or every business we do have runners we have runners with different gifts we have runners that even um, um run faster than others and as i said there comes a time when we have to get off that racetrack nobody lives forever businesses are to outlive us family members um, generations subsequent generations are to outlive us someone then takes over from where we have stopped or where we have left so usually there's a mantle or something that represents authority that is passed on to the new runner or to the new generation and i will call that mantle a button this button, as I said, is a mantle. It's a leadership. It's a gift. It's a sector. It's a responsibility. It's an authority. It's an emblem of commission to move to the next level. And as I said before, we're all in that race. Someone passes the button to us and we pass the button to others. And that is how life is. Now, the characteristic of the button bearer is such that he has to run his own race. How fast or how slow he does this determines the position of his team. And you can see the picture of the Nigerian team there rejoicing. So they run fast enough to be winners. So the button bearer can either run fast or slow. If he drops the button, it has its consequences. And he's someone who has the same vision or a similar vision, who has similar goals and who faces the finishing line, wants to get that project, wants to get that business, wants to get that family to a point where it can move, be moved on to the next generation or to a point where it can be moved on to the next runner. And sometimes not all run the same pace. As I said, some have gifts, but they are brought together to make a formidable team. So I'll also tell you a bit of my story. Those are my parents, my mom and dad. Both of them were medical doctors. My mother was a chest physician and she was to be a one time director general of the Lagos State Ministry of Health. My father was an ophthalmologist. My mother passed on in 2008 and my father in 2020. But at the age of eight, 
I remember this vividly. So maybe it was a divine impartment. A, a impartment. I stood in a compound in a papa on Marine Road. That time, civil servants were given residents, uh, residential quarters in different parts of Lagos, and we lived in a papa. We grew up in a papa. And I remember standing outside the garage. I was in a purple and orange adirette dress. I remember it vividly. Towards sunset, I just looked up at the sky and I said, I'm going to be a doctor. Now, there's a blur between that and when I went into secondary school. I know I finished primary school, secondary school, went to England, did my A levels, or came back to Ibadan to do medicine. And I finished in 1984. Now, I decided during my youth call, I had three choices um, to either do forensic pathology, which was my first passion, to do ENT, which was my second passion, or to do ophthalmology, which was my third passion. So after my house job and uh, while doing my youth call at Otta, it gave me time to think, what exactly did I want to do? In the end, I opted for ophthalmology. And that was because I thought as a forensic pathologist, you cannot work um, uh, separately. You have to work with the government. ENT was good enough. You can work privately. But ophthalmology, my father had already set up a place. And I thought, OK, I might as well um, learn about this ophthalmology he's been practicing. And um, so I decided to do the primaries. Thank God I passed both. West African and national and said, OK, I'd like to do my residency at Luth. Unfortunately, I wasn't taken in Luth. I was devastated. But my father said, look, I'll send you to my colleagues in Ireland. He got in touch with them, sent me to Ireland. And there I obtained the diploma. And afterwards, I was sent to different parts of the world to gain further knowledge in ophthalmology. Now, this is my late father. This is a picture of my late father. Now. He started practice as a sole proprietor. Many businesses, even during his time and even now, do start as sole proprietorship. My father started St. Edmunds, previously referred to as Quanta Qualia, in 1965. And in one of my discussions with him, I said, Sir, where did you? I used to call him Sir because he was also my boss. I hardly ever called him Dad at work. And I said, Sir, where did you get this name, Quanta Qualia? And he sat down, looked up, thought about it, and said, look, I had a lecturer while I was a student. He studied in Ireland. And this lecturer decided to talk about a Greek philosopher who debated with other people about the quality or the quantity. And he said, this lecture of theirs went on for weeks. At the end of it, the conclusion was that it is the quality that matters and not the quantity. And that stuck with him. So he was intentional. He was one of the foremost ophthalmologists in Nigeria. He was contemporaries with Dr. Akin Shete, who is older than him, who is still alive, Professor Olumi, Professor Abiose, Professor Anyaru, the late Dr. Dulate, amongst others. And he was intentional in setting up a training program for me. I didn't realize this. He exposed me to the best in the world. When I couldn't get into Luth, as I said, he sent me to his colleagues abroad, some of who are Fenton, Colum, I don't know if they are still alive, Eustace, um, Dugwit, McHugh. Dugwit was in Moffields, McHugh was in King's College. And I also met Mary with Story in Morfields, who introduced me to B-scans. And that's how I knew a lot about B-scans. He never said, Ayo, you are going to take over for me, never. But in retrospect, I see that he intentionally coached and mentored me. He took me to international conferences. I can now understand his actions because he belonged to the silent generation, being born in 1933. In one of our lecture series, a colleague um, and friend, Dr. Ogo, that's a lecture series 14, said that the characteristics of this generation, that's my father's generation, the silent generation, is that they parented quietly and without anything that brought attention to them. 
So I can understand why he was so quiet about many things. And here is a picture of St. Edmunds. There, there are lots of structural changes now. Uh, that's the picture I could um, bring up. Now, in a race, we have the precursor of Forerunner who slows down and the new bearer starts running. You can imagine this. There's a point where both are holding onto the button. Both are running together. And then he hands over the button, then turns aside completely of the track and watches from a distance. The forerunner is shouting from the side, urging, encouraging, hailing, motivating the baton bearer, and eventually hugging the baton bearer. The baton bearer runs fast, may fall, picks up himself, leaps over hurdles, obstacles, almost dropping the baton, but concentrates on the finishing line and eventually completes his race. An author said that the true act of leadership is to consider how to help one's replacement to hit the ground running. So in 2005, my father presented the baton to me and put me on a three year probation. It was all formally done. And we were both in that period running with the baton. He was still holding on to it and I was holding on to it. It was not fully in my hand, but I had started running with it. I was groomed. I was trained without being pressured. That is, I was not told, as I said before, that I would be the next medical director. Although all that said it, but it wasn't, he never told me that directly. There were a lot of conflicts prior to 2005, because I always went to him and I said, ah, so I've just come back from this conference. Let us get this. Let us get that. And he'll say youthful exuberance. He will say, slow down, I your youthful exuberance. I said, oh, we need to change this. We need to do this. We need to implement this. And we say youthful exuberance. Now I look back and I understand that he was coaching me. He was teaching me to be patient, to be persistent in getting things that I want done and to also apply wisdom. So as I said, I was groomed. I was given a three year probation in which to implement my ideas. I was able, thank God, to accomplish this. And at the end of that period, he came one day, I was in clinic. He came with a lawyer, his lawyer, and sent for me and I sat down and he said, look, I'm giving you full reins of the business. And he said, look, Ayo, can you hear me? Sorry, did I hear somebody? And he said, yes. yes. And he said, look, Ayo, you take charge of everything. Do what you need to do to move it to the next level. And I said, sir, what about the accounts? And he said, yes, you are going to be a signatory to the accounts and you run it the way you think best. So we as clinicians, how are we prepare for succession? How are we training future leaders? Are we giving them responsibilities? Are we giving them an open door and allowing them to make their mistakes? Yet letting them know that we are always available when they need us. Even when he saw I was making a mistake, he'll just keep quiet. He may say a word or two, but he, will, he never told me, do not do this. Do not do that. He always gave me words of wisdom and allowed me to make the final decision. And I remember at one time there was a crucial decision concerning the future of the hospital that I had to make. And I asked him what his thoughts are. He said, look, Ayo, I've done my part. You are to move it to the next level. But I could see that if I made the decision I wanted, it would kill him early. Because he was very pensive that period. He was quiet and he just used to look at me. But I went back to the chambers, my chambers to pray. And I kept praying, Lord, what do we do? What do we do? And I kept looking at my father. We both traveled together that year and he never said a thing. And then one day I said, okay, sir, this is the decision, which of course was what he was hoping I'll decide on. And I could see that life returned to him. He became alive again. And 
that 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 made me realize his human his humility. So this next slide shows the preparation. You can see one has lined up there. So in a way, there's a lineup, but before the one gets to this point in time, there's a time of preparation. And likewise, we who work in businesses and even in choosing a baton bearer, a successor, there's a time of preparation. There's the time of education, the person gains working experience, there's self-improvement, and then the person starts taking responsibilities in bits and pieces of um, the organization. Now, for an athlete, the athlete looks ahead. He looks to the finishing line. So even though they are looking down, initially, when they take that stance, they are looking ahead, focusing on the finishing line because they are in a race. Now, when it comes to a relay race, the, there's regular preparation and the athlete imagines himself passing the baton. He practices it in his mind and he practices it on the field before the actual race. And he does this because he's not in a 100 meter, 200 meter or 400 meter dash race. He's in a relay race. So he has to practice, how do I pass this baton so that it is passed on smoothly? Now this athlete has chosen and has been selected to be in the relay race. And I usually say that business owners have been chosen because that's what we call destiny. Yes, some businesses close after, after about between two and five years, but a business, every person has his destiny mapped out. And I use this word again, as I say, because on earth, we all have our destiny ordained from time immemorial. It is not by strength, but, but man is a free thinker and he can choose to be or not to be. So he now finds himself now back to the athlete and back to the um, baton bearer. He finds himself at the starting point of another journey of life and he stands and looks far ahead into the future. At the starting point, there are athletes of different ages, different colors, as you can see, different belief systems, different values that have been ingrained in them. And that is how it is in our businesses as well, in our families, all waiting to win that race, none wanting to disappoint himself or his team, none wanting to be a disappointment to the business, none wanting to be a disappointment to the family, or even, even if it is a small project, none wanting to be a disappointment in that project. Now, in a family business, I will talk about family businesses later. In a family business, there are different members that are, in the mind of the founder, potential successors. Passing the baton is a process. It is not a one-time event. There's the preparation phase, as I said, where there's training, coaching, mentoring, selection, and then action. Now, passing the baton may appear to take a few seconds or a moment in time, but that time encompasses years of training, years of coaching, mentoring, instilling values, and having a common vision. And when I look back, I realize that the baton was being placed in my life from my childhood. My father must have imagined himself doing that without saying much. And there were times I remember from very young, a very young age, I was taught to put drops into the eyes of his patients. That time the clinic was at um, a butemeta. And while the patient is on the table, he will call us into the theater and will stand on his stool he will talk to the patient and will apply drops into the patient's eyes. I learned how to clean trial lenses with chamois leather at a very early age and rearrange those lenses in the trial box. I had to learn how to clean the clinic floor, arrange patient's files, dispense drugs. And even while in medical school, during the holidays, when I come back, I'll put on a nurse's uniform. Used to be, uh, they, they used to wear caps in those days. So it was a blue uniform with a cap. And I was taught how to work as a nurse. I learned how to handle money. He, he taught us how to handle money, that you just don't uh, carry money anyhow. You hide money. He taught us that, how to keep the books, how to be accountable. 
how to handle people, how to relate with them. I was taught all this, but I did not realize that I was in the school of leadership. I was sent abroad, as I said before, to understudy his colleagues in Ireland, in the UK, at Stanford. All this I didn't realize was for a time like now. So to be a winner, to be successful and maintain success, it takes years of training, coaching and mentoring. You gain experience, you learn from your mistakes. And he was confident, my father was confident of how he had trained me and the values he had imparted in me, that he was bold enough to allow me to make my own mistakes. And he was always there to answer and advice if I sought opinion. I'll talk briefly about succession planning. I'm still learning about this. We do have gurus in succession planning that know a lot about succession planning. But one thing is that all organizations must experience succession or else they die. This was said by Friedman in 1988. Lack of succession planning is one of the reasons first generational firms do not survive their founders. And it has been shown that the succession of second generation entrepreneurs to control the business is challenging and often an unsatisfactory process. Some of us have examples of this, where second generations, not doctors, but leaders in their own right, were given their uh, the business, big businesses to take over. And unfortunately, things did not work out as the founder had planned. So in succession, sorry. And then also it, um, a business being handed over to a second generation person who has not been prepared. That business suffers. It can be very destabilizing. It can be destabilizing to even long time employees because these second generations have other ideas. In succession planning and choosing a leader, there's either a relayed succession in which the button is passed directly to an incoming Supervisor. CEO. Sorry? Can you hear me? Has somebody said something? Okay, so in a relayed succession, the pattern is passed from one leader to another directly, but there's also the horse race succession. I'm not very familiar with this, but it does occur in some organizations, big out organizations, in which um, two or more senior executives compete against each other with a focus being on their performance. And it is the board that actually oversees this. And their focus, as I said, is on performance. It has its good points and bad points. Now, during my probation period from 2005 to 2008, I also realized that I need to build a team for effective running of the business. So I looked at the different units we had and chose unit heads who were mandated with the responsibility of managing their team members. So we did give them managerial lectures, motivational lectures, either monthly or at six week stretches. And we encouraged mentoring and continuous coaching of junior staff. Now, like in any race and in any business and in any family, there are challenges. So while being prepared for this role as the pattern bearer, just as I said in a normal race, there may be distractions. One can get tired, one can get discouraged. There are hurdles to leap over, obstacles to overcome. There are emotional instability. And you're under pressure as a baton bearer not to fail the team or to drop the baton. You shouldn't even trip. Well, maybe if you trip, you shouldn't fall flat on your face. Now, there are two authors that pointed out that one of the negative characteristics in family business is where the founder is in conflict with the second generation. Also, founders of business may be in con <coughs> excuse me, conflict with, this, with another generation or with the junior leaders because that business was their baby. So some of them may not be open to new ideas. Some of them have very tough control. They are authoritarian and have strong emotional attachment. 
Now, the second generation gets frustrated, and this is very common in family businesses because the founder holds on to the old fashioned way of doing business and there's no planned structure. So this person goes abroad, gains knowledge, comes back and says, OK, we're now in charge of this um, winery um, or we're in charge of this manufacturing uh, business. I'm now home. I want to take I want to give my ideas. This is what I learned about manufacturing. This is what I learned and the incumbent, which is the founder, is resistant to that. But I thank God that my father was humble. Initially, after when he used to say, oh, youthful exuberance, he later started listening and he was humble. Even if I was wrong, he didn't shout back and say, no, 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 it can't be done. No, he listened. He listened and he allowed me to implement things. So one of the major cha uh, challenges was having a different outlook from my father. That is one of the challenges I faced in the sense that the business St. Edmunds was his baby. For me, it was a business. I did not have the same passion as he had. So even as a baton bearer, I felt mainly that it was my responsibility to ensure that that business does not collapse because he had put his sweat into it. But I did not have the same emotional attachment to it as he did. So that caused some conflict. Now, as a new generation comes with new ideas, they come and there's always that conflict. Also, one of the qualities of a good baton bearer is respect and humility. And there's what we call spiritual authority. So even though I disagreed with some of his ideas, I realized that he was not only my father, but also my boss. God had established his authority and I had to respect those ways, his ways of thinking and respectfully get on with him and allow him patiently to see things from my point of view, which eventually he did. There's also emotions with the team. Now, when I was handed over the button or even yes, in 2009 fully, there, had, there were employees that had been there while I was in medical school. So you can imagine me being their boss. So eventually when I was told that, look, Ayo, everything is being handed over to you. I said, look, sir, call all the employees. Let's have a meeting and tell them that you have handed over to me. There are some key ones that really had to hear that. And it is those key ones that were actually a clog in the wheel of progress. And when I threatened to sack them, they actually ran to him and reported me to him. But he was wise enough to tell them to wise up as well and to cooperate that this Ayo, she will do what she says she's going to do. There are some that I had to sack outright there and I didn't care what people said. So those were some of the challenges. There are also challenges with staff that have been used to doing things a certain way and getting them to change their way of thinking, putting structures in place. And um, yes, as I said, I had to dismiss some um, instantly. Then family members could also be a source of conflict. But I thank God, as I said, we were a family business. Um, my father and um, my brother, late brother, and um, my other sisters were made directors. But one thing we have learned over time is ensuring that there's professionalism. Because in a family, there are different members, there are different gifts. You, your siblings have different gifts. They think differently. I think differently. But we had to put the business first in everything, that what is best for the business, what will cause the business to survive. And even though we might have had or we did have different views about things, we had been brought up to always ensure that there's unity. So and thank God we're all a praying family. So we we'll go back and pray. God give us wisdom. Let there be peace. Tell us what to do. And by the time we get together again, we'll find out that we're all of one mind. So prayer plays a large role. It doesn't matter whether you're Hindu, and this is what I tell people, it doesn't matter whether you're Hindu, you're Buddhist, you're Muslim, you're Christian, or even atheists somehow believe in something. 
Go back to your maker. Go back to the higher being, God, and ask him for wisdom, and he will give you wisdom. And I remember when I was given the full reins, I said, Lord, please, as you gave Solomon wisdom, give me wisdom in running this business. Let me not be tempted, even in handling money. Let me be accountable to you, God, to my boss, to the employees, to the organization as a whole. And I thank God that he has helped me to maintain integrity all these years. So family values of contentment, unity, discipline, and the fear of God have been helpful in me facing the challenges that one usually faces. Now, along the way, every button bearer needs a mentor. John Maxwell defined a mentor as a person who is successful. Who is, who is larger than life, who walks alongside of you, who has a brain to pick, an ear to listen, has maturity, soundness and wisdom, who goes the way, shows the way and knows the way. So in my case, I chose and I'm privileged to have Dr. Kunle Hazan as my mentor. And when I told him this, he accepted that role in my life. I am what I am and where I am today, first by the grace of God, also by the role my parents played, especially my father in my career, and also through Dr. Hazan's influence. I first met him in 1997 when he came to visit my father to tell him about his plans, about uh, group practice, the use of the fac um, setting up um, a facility, how doctors are work, about training and all that. And I was invited to sit with them. And I sat and I listened. But by the time Dr. Hassan had finished speaking with my father, his, what he said was so infectious that I became a disciple of the business of medicine and also developed a greater desire to pass knowledge to another generation. So I made him my mentor because he has a listening ear. He taught me that there, there's always a solution to every challenge and never to give up and to think big. And I remember some years, many years ago, I ran to him and I said, I'm leaving St. Edmunds. And he said, no, you can't leave because that would be the downfall of that hospital. My father was still very much alive then. And I can never forget that. I've seen that he's a man who speaks his dream and we see that dream to come to reality. So when Dr. Hazan comes and says, okay, I'm going to do this. I know that it will come to pass. It may take time, but it will definitely come to pass. And it was that same year that I was encouraged to join the teaching faculty of the Eye Foundation and I started teaching residents. I then started work at the Eye Foundation as a part-time glaucoma specialist running a weekly Thursday clinic from 2003 to 2018. I had to step back in 2018 to be able to concentrate on and implement the next strategic growth plans for St. Edmunds. And I remember I went to Dr. Hassan three times, initially in towards the end of 2017, early 2018, and around Easter in April in 2018, and I asked to be released. And I'd like to say this to any of the young um, um, ophthalmologists that are listening, or to any person that's working in a business, nobody should leave a business with a bad record, especially if you have spent time there. Do not just leave abruptly, leave with a good record. Ask to be released, ask for their blessing. And when I did that, Dr. Hazan eventually said, okay. He said, but if you need anything, I am always there. My foundation is always there. And in 2019, the concept of KEFA was conceived and KEFA is the Kunle Hazan Eye Foundation Academy. And that's how I got involved again with the Eye Foundation Eye Care System. It is worthy of note that for years, every morning at 7.30 a.m., Dr. Hazan gave managerial lectures to senior staff. And I remember I used to write so many notes. I still have the notes up to today. And I applied those notes to St. Edmunds and I saw that they yielded fruits, not only in my personal life, but also in St. Edmunds. Now in 2015, I was eventually able to commence 
an online master's program in business administration by the University of Wolverhampton in the UK. And my study project was titled Succession Planning in Private Hospitals in Lagos State, the Need for Awareness. And I wanted to explore the Nigerian doctor's approach to succession planning and whether it is embraced by most owners of private hospitals. So I sent out one seven. I also wanted to find out whether there was a place of corporate governance in these practices and identify the hindrances to succession. So I sent out 170 questionnaires out of which 98 private doctors responded. And I use this opportunity to thank members of the um, Association for General and Private Medical Practitioners and some members of the Ophthalmological Society of Nigeria for contributing to that study. And my study showed that 50% of participants were in the 51 to 60 year bracket, followed by those over 60 years. So they were baby boomers strong at that time. And I found that there was a strong association between age and consideration of potential successors. But again, the 31 to 50 year old group were more likely to consider succession. And this was statistically significant. Now, 52.6% of businesses, hospital businesses were over 20 years. 75% of the doctors were 20 years post qualification. However, 80% of the doctors in my study felt that succession planning was important, yet only 64.5% of these doctors had not implemented any plan for succession with no definite successor in place. Many of them went into private practice, just like my father, with the intention of meeting their final obligations, and many still do now being financially independent and being able to practice their profession at a standard they felt would be much better than what government hospitals provided. Now, two organizations that were over 20 years, there were, there were two organizations that were over 20 years and one about six years old. Sorry, two of the organizations that were over 20 years old and one that was six years old had planned succession at inception. And at that time, those three had non-family successors, successors that were being groomed to take over. One of the greatest hindrances to succession planning I found was lack of trust. Some said the succession process is a cumbersome process. Yes, it's a long process. Some said there's loss of control. You don't have control to your money because many of these private uh, practices and it's not only the health um, in the health sex sector, but in all businesses, the extensions of our private pocket. So majority had no governance structures in place. The few who had a board said it was made up of family members, usually husband, wife and one other very close family member. For others, there was an informal board made up of advisors. So one of the main findings here was that a large percentage of doctors did not have a definite successor in place, thus endangering the sustenance of their business, lack of trust in potential successors and loss of control of the business. In one instance, a second generation successor had been groomed from when he returned to Nigeria, having completed his specialist training in the UK. It was 16 years later that he took over the organization or the hospital but by that time he was well equipped and qualified to take charge of the over 300 plus staff strong establishment. And he's still doing very well at the moment. Now, where are we now in St. Edmunds? It is still undergoing a metamorphosis. But as I said, we can be considered as a family business. There are different definitions of a family business, but most of them say that there's usually more than one family member that is a, a member of the board um, the founder is usually the chairman um, or a second generation. It has a prominent role in that business. All these can be checked on. I'm trying to um, stick to time. So we are building in St. Edmunds on the foundation that has been laid. We're expanding and running with the vision that has been laid down to provide excellent and quality eye care service in Nigeria 
and Africa with a global impact. We're also on the mission to be the leading eye care institute. Every hospital wants to be the leading eye institute. If you don't think big, you will not reach there. So providing excellent and quality services through efficient training and education with patient satisfaction and well-being as a motivating goal. We also ensure that we're living out our core values of loyalty, quality services, integrity, honesty, progress of the individual and the organization. So as I said, we're expanding the business. We were bringing in others with similar mindset who can work with transparency and sincerity. And presently we have an excellent team of eye care workers from the most to the least. From when I started running the company fully in 2009, we have over the years transitioned into a more formal structure with standing operating procedures and different lines of reporting. Internal control processes for accounting and financial management were put in place along with computerization of our accounts. We do have a financial advisory co uh, company, IBFC. We've also started functioning and then even though we were registered as a limited liability company in 2001, it was only in 2016 that we started functioning fully as a limited company. And we changed the bank account names to a limited company. So these structures were put in place. We employed the services, as I said, of a financial management company. We, that's IBFC Alliance. We changed our auditors. There's an auditor that had been there from when I was a medical student. I did not think he was as efficient as I expected him to be. And therefore I changed him, which he took badly, but that's a story for another day. So we brought in an HR consulting firm, that's HRX Consulting. And we also consider ourselves to be a learning organization. Thus, we have a yearly budget for staff training. And we have also commenced EMLs, that's electronic medical records, converting our, our files, our patients' records to electronic medical records. And studies have shown that these steps have resulted in sustained business performance and harmony in family relationships. We presently have an active board. We've, we've had an, a, a board, as I said, it was mainly family. But when we lost our father in, 2020, uh, in 2020, he was the chairman. We chose a non-family member to be the chairman of the board. Presently, Dr. Bad, Bode Kanwewe of Shops Dental Clinics, the chairman of Shops Dental Clinics Limited. So looking ahead, it is important that we leave a legacy. Now I'll just tell you this, that when I turned 60, the reality of my new age hit me like a bolt of lightning. And that is how it was. I woke up and I said, oh my God, I'm 60 now. And I realized that I had entered into the group of elders, not that I'm old, but I'd entered into the group of elders. And I must confess that I was deeply reflective that day. And it was a very tearful period for me because I felt that I was losing my youth. So I decided to go on my morning walk and started talking to God. And in the course of my discussion with God, he gave me the realization that the essence of life is leaving a legacy. Even Jesus came and left a legacy. So I decided as soon as I got home, I said, okay, let me check up the meaning of legacy. What does it mean to leave a legacy? So I checked uh, the Webster dictionary that defined it as something that is transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor from the past. And Google says that leaving a legacy means giving something that will be valued and treasured by those who survive after your death. It requires thoughts to ensure that any items that have meaning to you will also have meaning to those you designate to inherit them. And in this, um, on this slide, Dropping the baton is not an option if you want to leave a legacy. If a business is closed, there's erosion of that legacy that could be. Source of livelihood is at risk 
people who depend on the organization or, or who have spent years in your organization, you just suddenly close. A new person takes over and kicks all of them out. So their source of livelihood may be at risk. And there's degradation of the health sector. You have one less hospital in this nation of Nigeria of almost 200 million people. And if you are based in Lagos, of over 20 million people. So I use the analogy of an oak tree, and it's and this is the picture of an oak tree, and its unique characteristics to live in a legacy. Now apparently it grows as a shrub. It's one of the native trees in the UK, even though there are different species all over the world now. And it gives so it supports life of insects, birds, mammals such as squirrels, badgers, deer. And as it matures, it becomes broad. It spreads out with sturdy branches. It has holes and crevices to provide nesting spots for some bird species. Bats as well also rest in oak trees. And most of all, its timber is one of the hardest and most durable. And it is said that it takes up to 150 years for it to be useful in construction. I got this off the internet. It has tanning from its back that is used from, for tanning leather. And this is similar to a business that starts off small and grows to be a big organization. Applying the values of the founders, being nurtured with discipline and core values, that business becomes a source of employment and wealth provision to all and even to the nation. It expands with its branches and becomes a lifeline to the GDP of the nation. Smaller organizations can metamorphosize into something greater without losing that personal touch and the values of the founders, such as Morfields, the Royal Victoria Eye and Air in Ireland, Morfields in the UK, the Cleveland in America, the Aravind, Apasami Hospitals in India, the Eye Foundation here in Lagos, St. Nicholas, the Lagoon, which is now in Warsaw, Al Jolad, amongst many others. It is important that these values, the values of the founders, are instilled in the hearts and minds of those who come into the organization and head the different units or departments. Because if that it is done, they will pass it on to those that are under them, to the junior members. It is very important. So, Harvey Firestone says that it is only as we develop others that we permanently succeed. Leadership is important. Who you put in positions of authority, who you choose as a leader, who you eventually pass the baton to, who will run the race of succession to ensure that that legacy that you want lives on. Our parents be belonged to generation, the silent generation. We belong to the baby boomers. Well, maybe not all of us, some of us are older than the baby boomers, but we belong. I belong to the baby boomers and many of my contemporaries are, belong to the baby boomers and we're going into retirement. And we will likely pass the baton to the Y and Z generation, to the millennials. Now, which generation do you belong to? And remember that it takes years to have a good succession plan that will materialize. Now, Dr. Kule Hazan said that we should think back in our previous lectures. I will encourage every one of us to go back and listen to those lectures. In preparing for this lecture, I had to listen to all the lectures over and over and over again. And Dr. Hazan said that we should think big. Core values are very important in an organization. Professor Chris Obechi said that if we do not innovate and grow, we shall die. Dr. Michael Koku said that we should have a leader shift. We should think differently as leaders. Professor Fatima Kiari mentioned the real two blocks, uh, toolbox that we should reflect, we should engage, we should take action, and we should leave a legacy. Dr. Adonla Oguro talked about passing skills on to the next generation. And Dr. Professor Siku Matenge said that we should meet needs, both personal and organization. It has been a long journey, and I'm still in the race, running with the baton, 
and looking out for the next runner to whom I'm going to pass the baton on to. With God's help and discipline, St. Edmonds has metamorphosized from a sole proprietorship to a business. Faith and belief in one's ability has played a very key role in this journey. The baton will definitely be passed on in whatever form. Leave a legacy. So this is the end of my lecture. I pray that all I've said will help us to think deeply, especially those of us that are still running sole proprietorships. Even those of us that have reached the stage where St. Edmunds is, what next? Be proactive, be intentional. If we're not intentional about succession, it will not happen. It's a long journey. It's not easy, but it is possible. Others have done it. We can do it. Pass on the button. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Harriman, for this wonderful lecture. It's been very interesting and even I am not at that level of the top of thinking of succession, but it's, it's, I, I have learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I will take questions. If you have any question or comments, you can raise your hand or you type your question in the chat box. I have um, Dr. Koku's hand is up. Dr. Koku, please can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Ariman. I really saw the youthful ex exuberance that your dad said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over Thank 60 you. now, so I'm a young 60 plus. <laughs> but you know what, the, the beauty yeah. of everything was like, thanks for so much that you brought to the table. I, since I knew you, I knew you to be a person of detail. Uh, a person of commitment, and we really enjoyed your presentation. Actually, I have a virtual facilitation today. I said, no, I must be here. One question I, I want to ask you, Dr. Joe Maswell said something. He said, legacy is not what you leave for others, but what oh. you leave in others. You know, and this is really countercultural, especially to the African culture. People are expecting legacy to be what property. I believe the greatest thing that your dad left for you is not the hospital, the equipment, but the values. So my question for you is that what are the top mm -hmm. three values? Uh, because since legacy is what we lived in people, not for people. So what will be the three top, uh, the top most value that you can share with us that your dad really instilled in you? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Koko. I really appreciate you joining this. Now, he left with us honesty, he left with us patience and love. That's the thing. I remember when you know, as children, you tend to be protective of parents. And you will see that somebody is taking advantage, especially as he grew older. People were taking advantage of him. And there we were just throwing tantrums. But my father would speak gently. Most times he wouldn't even report them. But it's what we saw. So love was one of them. Mm. Patience. As I said, he, youthful people are... The young people, even if you look at this generation now, they are very impatient. They are instant. So I went through that phase. And that's why I try to understand the younger generation now, although we're still different. But patience, he will say, Suru, Suru, Suru. Their patience was that and honesty. Mm -hmm. So even though it was a sole proprietorship, he had an accountant, he had an auditor. Mm -hmm. Every money he spent was accounted for. And that was instilled in us. He would leave money there. As I said, he didn't expose it, but we knew where money was. We wouldn't go and touch that money. We were accountable. Everything was accounted for. So honesty, integrity, he left mm. with us. And hard work. Mm. He used to say hard work does not kill. And I saw that he lived till 87 plus. 
and he continued working hard, although not as active, but he worked hard in reading, mag uh, reading journals, even in his old age. Mm. Yes. Mm. That was beautiful. My, my second question is this, so that others can ask that question too. Um, what is your uh, what is your plan for association? Uh, the moment uh, you said when you cross the six zero line and uh, the Diamond uh, League, and uh, there was a new reality that dawned on you. What will be your own strategy uh, to um, to really um, pass the baton and uh, so when do you plan to make that transition because this will really inspire people to know when to do that you know because there's always a place where to pass the baton during the race and uh, i watched this jamaican uh the last league that uh, the last uh, one world championship that they did uh they couldn't execute uh, they always win uh, they become forced because of this problem of baton they didn't pass the baton very well uh so they, there's a zone where the uh, baton is being passed to the next phase so there was a real mix up there and they lost the race to the united states which were glad to have the first position you know because when the jamaicans are running the only thing you can only pray for is the second position yeah so what will be your own um, uh, strategy and uh, what do you think you can do better than what your dad did for you because every generation is meant to be an improvement of the previous thank you yeah thank you very much first of all i will not let the cat out of the bag <laughs> but <laughs> but i'll say that i have a five-year plan that is one okay. in five years i should be 65 going on 66 by which time there should be someone who has started running the business. Now, towards the end of my lecture, I said that the baton will be passed on in whatever form. It may either be directly or it may be indirectly through the racehorse um, succession plan. Mm. So, um, but basically, for a family business to transit to the next stage, even if there's no family member to take over directly, certain structures have to be put into place. Mm. And we are intentional in putting those structures into place so that even if at the end of it all, even if at the end of it all, the business has to be sold, it has to be of value. It has to be of high net worth value mm. for other family members to benefit from the proceeds of that. So, as I said, it's a five year plan. Mm. There are stages to succession. It's not just an overnight thing. I remember speaking with um, um, Azedor Peter side at one time, especially soon after my father passed on. And I said, Azedor, I don't know what to do. Who is going to take over from me? And he said, succession is a long process. And as I just, just speaks bluntly, he said, it's, it's a long process. You know, and that, um, that, that, that put me in check. And I said, okay, I'll be intentional about it. So over the years, we've been putting structures in place, getting advice. We now have an external chairman. The board will move to the next level. We're also been um, we're attending um, um, courses on board diversity, so all mm. those things, yes. But I don't want to let the cat out of the bag as of now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuku. We have uh, Mr. Paul. Your hand is up. Mr. Paul, please unmute yourself. Mr. Paul Wagala. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Dr. Harriman. Uh, hi, um, Mr. Paul. Thank you. Um, well, I thank you for this um, insightful lecture. Um, I, I've seen a few, a few texts on succession planning, and one of the biggest, the common challenge I see in all most of them is lack of trust. 
Um, so when when do you really trust your successor? How do you uh, overcome this challenge about lack of trust? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, we're still in the process there, but some of my senior colleagues, including uh, Dr. Hassan, has done a lot of work on that. And um, lack of trust is a big issue, even amongst family members, lack of trust. But like in our own case, our upbringing values, the values are important. How was, how did that person grow up? What are the values that that person has? Values play a very large role in building trust. One of the things I used, I was the sole signatory. As I said, we're in evolution. So I was the sole signatory to the accounts. I never stole money. I never used money for my own personal aggrandizement. Even when we had new um, a new auditor, not a cobble or a naira was missing, not even a dollar was missing. So integrity, the person's background, the person's values, it's the values that are important. So even in choosing a successor, you, there, are, there are many, like the I Foundation is a big organization. There are many doctors, there are many potential successors, but who can take the, the play, who, who can stand as a leader with integrity? I'm sure Dr. Hazan is online here. We'll be looking at each person's character. Oh, this person is better suited to this. This person is better suited to that because they build leaders as well. So you, you look at the person over the years. Now, supposing somebody comes in from outside and this person is a successor, those interviewing the person must have had a background check on that person. But well, sometimes, yes, we do miss it. So I hope that answers your question. But if not, there are my senior colleagues that um, are in a better position to answer. Thank you. OK, we have another question in the comment section. And first of all, it's a comment. So thank you very much, Dr. Harriman. The lecture is quite impactful. This is from Mr. Olale Daniels. His question is, how can an organization effectively plan for succession when you are not certain of how many people will be leaving the organization both voluntarily and involuntarily over the next five to seven years. Should I take that again? I understand it. Okay. I think a more mature person will be able to answer that. <laughs> One thing I learned from Dr. Hassan is that you keep training. You keep training. People will leave. You cannot keep them. You cannot stop them, especially now that many people are leaving the country. But you keep training. Even if um, um, uh, a colleague told me, a um, very close colleague, his senior, they had been training this doctor, somebody they relied on. And in the end, the person said, he's moving abroad. So what do you do? You can't hold the person down. You just have to keep training. And in some organizations, there's a leadership um, ladder or pipe. But I think Dr. Hassan will be in a better position because he's experienced this. So sorry, sir, I'm throwing the question back to you. <laughs> well, I'll just say some few words after they finish. Let's, let's go on asking the questions. Maybe I'll be able to chip in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, um, I have um, Dr. Ajayi Obe Kundayo. You have your hand up. Please, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Thank you. Um, hello, Ayo. Hi, Ayo. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Fantastic lecture. Thank you. And yes, um, I've, we've walked, so I know what you've been through. And um, I just want us, you know, we, I just want to make a comment. A lot of energy goes into building your practice. A lot of energy from the founder and from subsequently, subsequent um, passing the baton, the person. And I think it's important that we realize that that energy is not lost. And that's what I like about uh, your journey. You have all your father's energy 
has not been lost. All the energy of getting those patients into a practice and being able to carry it on. And the fact that even when a practice closes, you throw a lot of confusion into the midst of these patients because they have to go and look for somebody else and gain the trust. So the fact that your father was able to hand over to you, the patients also, you have three, four generations of patients that have actually been in your practice and they've seen it being handed, then being handed over to you. So I think it's one thing that when you talk about Nigeria as a whole, when practices close, you throw a lot of confusion into the patients themselves because they're having to start all over again. I know our environment is a word of mouth. It's all about word of mouth. Actually, black, black culture as a whole is word of mouth. So I really want to thank you for this brilliant lecture. I want to thank you for the journey that you have walked through, this faithful, faithful journey that you've walked through. And I'm hoping that other people who have practice realize uh, what has actually gone into it. And there's hope for our country, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dayo. And thank you for your input in the initial stages. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we have another hand up, um, Dr. David Ogunaya. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Ma, and good afternoon to all our mentors and senior colleagues. Thank you, Ma, for the wonderful lecture. It was very not boring and very. Thank you. Um, it, it was very wonderful. Thank you very much. My question is when I saw the flyer passing the button, I was really wondering if it was relevant for some of us at the millenn millennial or Gen Z stages of of life or you know beginning people who are <laughs> beginning their careers so my question is well let me still ask it if it is relevant to start thinking of the end like that when you don't even know or you're not sure exactly you're starting your career and then what are the most important lessons to take out for those in that generation thank you Sorry, have you asked your question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, can you go over it again? Because I, I, the I last was time was you, that generation. Thinking about passing the button is relevant for those starting their careers. And what is the most important lesson for in that for people at that stage? OK, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Okay. Th uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Bonaya. I know you are a second generation ophthalmologist in the making. Now, um, it's relevant. It's relevant not only to doctors, it's relevant to any person who is in an organization and who aspires to move up the ladder. So the pattern is not only passed to, to um, a child, the button is passed to any other person in a leadership position who will be able to take that organization or that department or that unit or that family to the next level. So it's for anyone. That's the way I see it from a senior from one generation to another or from one level, one senior person to another. Now, the most important thing is humility. Because I worked closely with my father. In those days, we used to do intracapsular cataract surgery. He taught me the basics of surgery. So that one thing he said is that wound closure is very important. So that when you see that patient, maybe 10, 12 years down the road, you see that that eye is still intact. Even if there are other complications that might have arisen, secondary glaucoma, blah, blah, blah. But the wound, there's no wound defect. So I learned a lot from him. I learned the technique of doing surgery, good surgery, of running an organization, of talking to patients. Yes, there are some times that I felt the, 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 what this man is thinking, that uh, this is not the way they treat anymore. Uh, they don't do things this way. But I had to learn humility. 
I had to learn that he is my teacher, even if I felt that there's a new way of doing things. Yes, I will still listen. So humility, which is what many young people are lacking now. Humility, be ready to learn, be submissive. Don't be stupid, but be submissive. Have a learning culture. That's all I'll say. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much. We have, um, I'll take two more questions and then we'll take um, Dr. Hassan's inputs. For any questions, you might not be able to take this period. We'll try to take them in our next session due to time so we can take the time. And um, the next question is from Dr. Dada Teresa. Please, can you unmute your mic and ask the question, please? And the next person is Dr. Jeme Adomi. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I just had to put an input into your lecture. This has been you, extremely exciting, thank exciting, you. inciting every adjective you can use. And as you know, we go back to medical school. Your father was the one who actually got me into ophthalmology. And I will say not actively. You know that. After we, we finished work, you went upstairs, we went to a Joel Legba clinic. You went upstairs, you went to see patients. And what did I do? I used to go into the private rooms upstairs and practice my typing on the manual typewriter. And your father never once said, what are you doing? Go down to the clinic. You, he never said that. I made up my mind some years, about a couple of years later to go into ophthalmology. And I thank him for that. And that is what your father stood for. He let you make your mistakes. He let you make your decisions. And you have highlighted that. Uh, one thing also is that Patience is virtue. I can see that in your attitude as your, as your father passed on to you, as well as you have not been, you have, you have been very proud of your faith. And I'm glad you have highlighted this, that faith plays a very important role in our lives. Uh, not many people want to admit this, but you have openly admitted that and how it has actively helped you with your decisions. You are like your father, you are patient, you are, you, you are clever and you, you have many words of wisdom. Um, as you said, passing the battle, it has been a very, very, very important topic to deal with. And, you know, it has opened my eyes to many things and I have taken many messages, jotted things down. I hope we'll be able to uh, to uh, have access to your lecture so that we can sort of listen again and go slowly. Uh, but I thank you and I thank you and I thank you. And I hope your business does go far, as you said. If you pass it on to Kith and Kin, or if it is on to whoever takes over the baton after you, I'm sure it will continue to thrive. I remember Quanta Qualia, and it really is quantity quality. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. Can you take a question, please? That's the last question we can take for today until Dr. Hazan says the session. Thank you. I think he has to unmute, unmute, sir. Okay, I'll take one more question from the comment section. Um, we have this from Dr. Isedio Sanzei. Say thank you very much for this interesting lecture, man, as it relates to young ones. Do we wait to receive the button or we run and show interest to go collect the button? What is more virtuous? What I'd say is just putting your best. If you are good and it is due you, you will get the button. But keep working with an excellent spirit, with passion with integrity um, and you'll get there. But if you keep looking at the button, I want it, I want it, I want it. Right? There'll be a lot of politics to that. You know, but it's still good to be ambitious and to think big. You know, but I think if you are just running after the button, uh, the button may just drop and you may not get it. So wait for it to be handed over. But don't focus on that, focus on doing the right thing and moving 
whatever organization or family that you are doing, moving them forward. I never looked for this position. I found myself thrust into it. Yeah, I'm not the first born, I'm the second born. But even then, I didn't ask for it. It was thrust upon me there, and I, I worked hard. Thank you, Dr. Francis. On what you said now, there's a question that you might just be able to answer from Dr. Chukwemfa Ume. He said, thank you for your presentation. Where do you draw the line between best capable and best family aligned in succession? Most traditional yes. Nigerian family... Okay, sorry. Where do you draw the line between best capable and best family aligned in succession? Most traditional Nigerian family businesses look towards the first form. I think you look for who is capable. It depends on what the founder, I'm not in, in that position yet, but you will look for who is capable and who will run with your values and who is able to keep the family intact or who is able to keep the business intact and the business going. That's what I think you look for. Not necessarily, the first is not necessarily the best. It may even be the last. Uh, David in the Bible was the last of his family, and yet he was chosen to be king over Israel. So that's my two takes. But I, um, Dr. Hazan has vast experience in this, and I think we'll leave the floor to him to be able to say um, some words. Please, sir, over to you, sir. <laughs> Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Ariman. It's been a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Sir. Um, I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> well, uh, let's look at the element of trust. I believe trust uh, in an organization can be built as a culture through good internal control processes, uh, good governance and also a sort of focused mentoring. Uh, you will be able to identify the strengths and weaknesses of members of your staff. And you can create a synergy by concentrating on where their strength is and helping them to build their weakness. And also when you're doing this, put into consideration that everybody has a free agency to go where they want to go. You can keep anybody against their witch, however important they are to the system. So you should always have a backup plan. You know, uh, if you build an executive that are strategic, the goal should be, one of the goals is be to build the next leaders that can take off, that can take over from them. But most leaders want to sit on things. And if you don't pass it on, you can have the time for strategic thinking. So you have to push them along by raising the bar. So they be forced to discover the talent down the line. And those who are down the line organization where there's a very good training and succession plans and identify uh, a good appraisal system, you'll be able to push them along. Uh, in our organization, you can be a nurse, but a nurse can be a hospital service manager. A nurse can rise to any level through experience. So you watch out for that. Their talents support it and provide necessary training. And as you know, trust must be verified. So don't just give a blanket, even if it's your son, your daughter, or somebody. No. If you want to build an institution, family is second. If any member of the family walked in, must know that they, they must walk in because they want to be there, not because they want to hand over to your family. For the people who have spent years in building that institution, uh, it's important as you no know, more than any member of your family. Your family, family is their fault. That family member should realize that there are people in front of them who are building that institution, and the institution do not belong to their family. Is an institution on its own, and it's got to attract people from different spheres of life, and you have to. The second thing and most important is your 
business and financial model. From the beginning, you start a business, you must put your exit strategy in place. The very first day I decided I was coming to Nigeria and was going to establish an institution, I planned my exit strategy. I'm planning your exit strategy that will enable you to work with people who are smarter than yourself, like you, and others, many of our consultants, give them responsibility. And as we expand, those who have been through our system, I, we've trained them to is whereby not only to be sound in terms of being an ophthalmology, but also in terms of that we are in a business and that business must survive. And for that business to survive, you too have to be a business unit with that business. So you have to look at your financial arrangement. You have to ensure that, hey, these guys must be able to feed the family, ride a good car, send the children to the best school, have a roof over their head. How are you going to ensure that your business model can deliver that? If you can not deliver that, you just yeah, you can't help them to grow. You watch them go, and there's nothing you can do about it. And there's some that are very talented, but they lack the discipline. They cannot conform to the discipline of institutions. Such people, however brilliant they are, you let them go. There are other areas where they can they can be useful. So in your succession plan, you have to put all these in place right from the word go and identify the talents and make sure you can definitely ensure their livelihood, livelihood is guaranteed. And also you have to plan their own exit strategy. And that exit strategy must be robust than yours. Um, so as a, as a leader that wants to be an institution, you, as you grow older, you don't think of the amount of years you put into it. Because if you're thinking of that, my need when I was here and also as a medical director is different from the need of the next generation. So you must be prepared to meet that need so that they can survive. So it's all the aggregates of this, which you yourself cannot predetermine, but you can put all those key drivers in place and watch it. And the strength of our organization is human resources. We spend a lot of money on training. And therefore, you have that we're training ophthalmologists, we're training optometrists, training the nurses, and then the ophthalmic practitioners. So it's easy for you to keep the best within that training scheme and let some go. Some of your best brain will go fine, but you 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 have a succession uh, line in place that you can easily replace someone and try to build them so that they are multi-talented. You know, you can be a nurse, you can be a doctor. A nurse can have more administrative capacity and focus in terms of management than doctors. So you you plan on putting a round peg in a round hole, and that will, that will help a lot. So uh, these are the little things we put in place and ensure that you cater for your staff like you when when as you mentioned when you are going yeah but i as a as a leader in the organization i always look at it what is good for you are very honest you are running a clinic and you are also running your st edmund hospital there's no day you diverted a patient from your hospital i mean from our hospital to yours it's on record we monitor all those things and there are even patients coming from St. Edmunds to us. And they are from, oh, because we of the trust you've reflected in a psychic as a honest man, you see some patient coming from Sulu Lady, we ask them, go to St. Edmunds. St. Edmunds is closer to you, they're coming here. So it was a synergy, it was a synergy of trust and also integrity. But no system is 100% proof. There will always be, uh, People we want to do something or the other against them, but the most important is that majority of the activity within the system follow the processes, the control, and we ensure 
that what is the next plans for this member of staff that has spent so many years is going to leave us. When you are leaving, after, I know you had a passion for teaching. I know you had it, but St. Edmund cannot provide for that. So we see there's a key place for you, which you are still playing the role at the same time, developing your vision for St. Edmund. So these are the things that leadership will reflect in a sort of a personality and a vision for the growth of the people within a system. There must be diversity. There must be area where their strength. If their strengths cannot be achieved or their vision cannot be fully achieved within a system, it's better we have them to build their goals. They will always be a great ambassador of our institution and they will come back to, you know, to protect that institution. And this is the way things can, can, can we continue to be and we continue to enjoy that sort of professionalism. I, I pray and wish that the newer generation that are here, we see the strength in working together in collaboration and also giving the best to the person that deserve it. Not a matter of family, friends or this and that. You let the best guy do the best job. And everybody from the cleaner to the MD can add value to the organization. And that's why it was most important. Build an institution and not your family and not yourself. Um, there'll be family challenges, but as they see, share the vision, look at what is going on. They too will become part of it and things will evolve. Um, I'm sure Sademans will go to places. And as I always say, the eye care industry is huge. There's still more room for synergy. There's more room for cooperation and using the resources within the country to build a better future for the eye care industry. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Harriman, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you for everyone who joined us. We appreciate you. And um, we will let you know when the next session will be. If you are not following the Kole and San Ai Foundation Academy on YouTube, you can please search for us on YouTube, follow us. We usually upload all the series and all the lectures on there. Thank you so much. So our next session will be announced and we will let you know. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.